Hey, my name is Ben. Thanks for stopping by. In this video, we're going to be talking about the top 10 mistakes that people make when installing vinyl plank flooring. Obviously, if you've been installing vinyl plank for a really long time, a lot of these are going to seem really obvious. But if you're just getting started or you're doing a project yourself, you definitely want to pay attention to some extra details that you may not have thought of. Real quick, before we get started, I'm going to link in the description of this video to all the recommended tools and accessories that you should use when installing vinyl plank. You don't really need very many complicated or expensive tools to do this, so it's really a nice DIY project uh, to be able to accomplish without having to spend a whole bunch of money on tools, but links and resources in the description as always. The first mistake people make is not taking enough time to properly prepare the subfloor. The subfloor is the primary floor surface or floor material that is structural to the building. So whether that be concrete underneath the vinyl plank or a wooden subfloor, that material needs to be very well prepared. Depending on your situation, you may actually need to put down an underlayment on top of your subfloor before you put down your vinyl plank. Just make sure that whatever you use is actually certified to be used as an underlayment. If it were me working on the project, I would probably opt for going with a half inch plywood. The other thing that's nice about going with a slightly thicker material is you don't have to screw it down nearly as frequently. Tongue and groove is another consideration if you can get tongue and groove. Uh, that's also a really good option because it interlocks one to the next, but that's probably optional in most cases. Some vinyl planks have a little bit of padding built into the backside of the vinyl plank, which can accommodate a tiny bit of variance. But if you use a thinner product and you have a nail poking up just a little bit somewhere, what can happen is this nail head at first, you won't notice it, you'll install it, everything will look fine. But over time, the vinyl will actually conform to the shape of the nail head, and you'll have a little spot where you can see where the nail is pushing the vinyl up. So you definitely want to make sure you take the time to go through and countersink every nail or fastener that is on your subfloor, whether that be nails or screws. If you have screws, you're going to want to take a drill and drill that back down into the floor a little bit further, or you may need to remove it. But if you do remove a fastener, I usually recommend that you put a new one back in again to avoid creating any extra squeaks in the actual subfloor material. Once you get all of the fasteners recessed down into the subfloor, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and take a product like Rock Hard Putty and go ahead and push that into any voids in the floor, including both nail holes or fasteners that have been countersunk a little bit too much. You're gonna to wanna to go ahead and fill those voids and get it as close to perfectly level as possible with the rest of the subfloor. Once you have all those small imperfections taken care of, you're actually gonna to wanna to take a relatively long straight edge Edge, or even just like a four foot level and use that to go around the floor and try to find any dips that are very significant. Now every manufacturer is going to have different tolerances and how much variance in the floor you are allowed to have. So always read the instructions that came with your vinyl plank flooring before beginning. But if you do find a decent dip, you're going to actually have to fill that in with some kind of a self leveling compound or a feather edge product. I'll link those in the description, but basically you're going to mix that up and smooth it into whatever areas need additional filler so you can make a nice flat surface with no dips going through it. There are a ton of different options when it comes to underlayment and padding that can go underneath your floor. The main thing that I would check is uh, with the manufacturer as to how thick and what types of underlayment are allowed. If you buy the wrong thing, they might deny warranty if it's too thick or if it's not compatible. So definitely check on that. The one main benefit of maybe adding a padding or underlayment underneath your floor is that this little bit of uh, pad is gonna allow the floor to just be a little bit quieter when you walk on it since there won't be that rigid vinyl edge resting directly against the subfloor. If you wanna have padding underneath your vinyl, I would go with a product that has the attached padding like this one right here. Comment down below though if you have a different opinion or if you think that uh, padding is absolutely essential, I'd really be curious to hear your thoughts. Vinyl plank is a lot like paint where a lot of the work is the preparation, a lot more than even 
the actual installation of the product. If you just start installing it right away without paying attention to the details of your existing floor or your existing subfloor, you're really gonna regret it and run into issues with popping and clicking sounds when you walk over the top of your vinyl plank, which is just really horrible. As soon as someone hears that popping sound, especially if you have any experience in flooring at all, you know that they didn't take the time to do a proper job of surface prep. If you listen and watch, you'll see the areas where it compresses as you walk across it, where there are dips. And those noises you hear wouldn't normally be present if it had been installed properly. You can see right here, there's a pretty big bow in the floor, pushing up kind of actually, which is kind of interesting. Up here, Same thing continues, and right over here you can even like compress this one section here and see how much of a gap we're able to create by doing that. And then over here in the bathroom, it's kind of tricky around a floor drain anyway because the floor is sloping down, but right here this piece has actually come pretty much loose entirely. So you can only ask so much of vinyl plank when it comes to imperfections in the floor. And if you don't want to have to do self-leveling concrete over the top of everything, which is probably what was needed here, then a possible alternative would be to use a sheet vinyl product, which comes in a big roll, like a 12 foot wide roll. And that will conform to whatever the shape of your floor is, and it won't have an issue with the interlocking problem. Although sheet vinyl typically is not as durable as vinyl plank is. So just keep that in mind. You have to know what the limitations are of the flooring type that you're using. The second mistake that people often make with vinyl plank flooring is anchoring it to the subfloor, either on purpose or on accident. So I actually am guilty of this in the sense that I actually anchored my vinyl plank flooring down in this installation in two different locations. Now I did it intentionally, I knew that I was doing it and I didn't think it was gonna cause an issue, but it absolutely did. I'll show you the problem I caused for myself in just a minute, but the other common way that people oftentimes attach their vinyl plank to the floor, sort of accidentally, is they install their vinyl plank flooring before they install their kitchen cabinets. By doing that, when you go and set your cabinets in place, it's obviously going to hold that vinyl plank exactly where it was when the cabinets were installed. So it's going to restrict its ability to expand and contract. Most vinyl plank floors are floating floors, meaning that they're not supposed to be attached to the floor anywhere because of the expansion and contraction based on the temperature of the building. Let's take a look at the problem I caused. Now this issue really does stem from the fact that I didn't follow my own advice with doing really adequate surface prep. If I had done proper surface preparation, I probably never would have been tempted to do the thing that I did in this particular instance. And that is from right over there to right over here, we have a bit of a change in height of the floor. Now I did use feather edge and did my best to prep it, but we still have a little bit of a dip right here. So I found that when I installed these few rows right here, when I kind of would walk over it, I could hear it kind of clicking and popping apart. Part. And so what I thought I'd do is just go ahead and put a little bit of silicone underneath these few planks right here. And by doing that, I obviously attached my vinyl plank to the subfloor. In my defense, the reason I thought I was gonna be able to get away with this is that if you just pin your floor down in one location, you actually probably won't have an issue because the vinyl plank will be able to expand and contract from that spot. It'll be attached right there, but everywhere else it should be loose. However, I did a terrible thing and anchored the floor one other spot right over here. I had a very similar issue with this plank right over here where it was just kind of clicking a little bit because there was just a little dip that I missed during my surface preparation. So I used a little bit more silicone right here, but by doing that, I now had two spots where my vinyl plank was pinned right here and right over there, about 15 feet away. I did not think that 15 feet of vinyl would be enough of expanding and contracting to really cause an issue, but right over here, the proof 
is in the pudding. First, let's take a look at one that doesn't have the issue. You can see that our lines are nice and tight. There's really no problems that you can see there. If we look straight down at this one, however, you can see that we've got a little bit of a lip showing right there. And you can see that there's a gap right there I can almost stick my fingernail into. The temperature of this floor when I installed it was probably around 73 degrees or so. And right now in this house, it's about 63 degrees. So it's about 10 degrees less than when it was installed. So just that little bit of temperature difference was enough to pull these planks apart and cause this, ri this ridge to appear right here where this interlocking tongue and groove meet together on these two separate pieces. So since it pulled it out, it also popped this up. Kind of a terrible thing uh, in the sense that this has the potential to break off this edge entirely right here, uh, or it's gonna wear prematurely and the finish is actually gonna come off the top of the floor. So do not ignore the fact that expansion and contraction is something that is going to happen. What I'm gonna to do to fix that problem, hopefully, is just come back over here and step on my tools and disconnect the floor from the subfloor. Tapping that back in that direction and hopefully that lip will lay back down, but I probably caused some permanent damage. So don't do this. Watch till the end of the video and we will actually fix the problem where I anchored my floor down in two different locations uh, so that we're able to tap those back together. Um, we'll show you that at the end of the video. Now, pinning your floor down in two locations like I did over there is absolutely terrible. However, there is a situation where I think it's perfectly acceptable to do so and kind of necessary if you wanna have a quality installation. And that location is the bathroom. When you install a vinyl plank around your toilet, do not cut your vinyl plank around the base of the toilet in the shape of where it is sitting. You need to pull the toilet up put vinyl plank right up to the toilet flange and then reinstall the toilet. By doing that, you're obviously going to be pinning the vinyl plank to the floor, but it should only be in one location. And most people's bathrooms aren't so huge that you're going to have major expansion and contraction across the room. This room right here is not that many feet across. It's probably like eight feet by eight feet or something like that. But even if it was a little bit larger, it wouldn't be a big deal if the vinyl plank is pinned under the toilet. Don't worry about it under that circumstance, but in every other circumstance, do everything you can to avoid pinning the vinyl plank to the floor. I've installed vinyl plank at several different properties and not ever had the issue of them pulling apart like that. So I guess I just thought that that rule didn't apply to me, but uh, it definitely does. And I definitely regret that I made that mistake and especially that I made that mistake intentionally. The third mistake to avoid is failing to calculate your first and last rows of vinyl plank and making sure that you don't end up with a narrow strip of flooring left over on one side because you just started with full rows on the opposite side. One cool thing about this particular floor is that this actually has multi-width planks, which makes that problem almost go away as long as you're fine with your last row, potentially being one of the others that's not in the specific pattern that the manufacturer recommends. Because basically the way they do it is they say, okay, we've got a standard width plank, narrow, standard, wide, standard, narrow, standard, wide, like that pattern all the way across. But if you have the random width planks, you can go ahead and cheat it and use a row that's a different width in a different spot. And that does make it a little bit easier. Most vinyl plank products, however, are going to just be a standard width and not have multiple different widths to choose from. So with that, you need to go ahead and calculate out the width of your room, divide it by the number of planks that you're gonna be able to fit in that space and see if you need to start with a partial row on the location where you are beginning to install your vinyl plank. One thing that can help in that process is to actually interlock about 10 pieces of your vinyl flooring and then measure the length of those 10 pieces and use that to help multiply across the room. Because if you're taking the exact you know, 5.387 inches of each plank and trying to do the math on that, it can be kind of tricky. But if you just go ahead and click 10 pieces together, it makes it a little bit easier to figure out where that's gonna land. The fourth mistake is not removing your baseboards or using quarter round. Now this could be a matter of opinion for some people depending on your situation. Maybe you love quarter round, but basically quarter round is a piece of wood that you're gonna be putting 
in addition to all of the baseboard that you already have installed. And that can start to look a little bit bulky and just a little bit cheap looking in my opinion. So you can see we've got this last piece of baseboard here to put back in. And by pulling that out, that allows us to let the vinyl plank go underneath where that baseboard was. And we also still have enough room for our expansion gap. Our expansion gap is gonna be from the edge of the vinyl plank until it hits whatever surface is behind it. Now typically you're gonna have drywall, which is a half inch. So as long as you have kind of undercut the drywall, uh, you'll have plenty of an expansion gap to where we can then take our piece of trim and reinstall this. I have to pull the nails out of this piece still. Uh, and we will have a perfect installation with no bad looking quarter round going all the way around the installation. One additional quick tip for you guys is that a lot of times you can actually get by without pulling all of the baseboard. If you have a wide enough stretch where you're putting your vinyl plank in, you can oftentimes get it kind of slid underneath one end if you have went ahead and undercut your baseboard. By doing that, we can slide it in that direction just a tiny bit and then cut our lengths going across and then after we snap that last piece in place, we can actually slide it back and average them out. And you can see how we have no gap on either side right here. And we also did not have to pull the baseboard out. So it's a little bit more tedious maybe, but I think it's worth it in the labor that you save and not having to take off and put the baseboard back on again. But again, that's fully optional and it depends on your situation. Another common place to see quarter round is around the base of the cabinets where the toe kicks are located. If we take a quick look though at what I've done here in this particular installation, uh, we have basically undercut our toe kicks just a tiny little bit so that there's room for this to expand underneath the cabinet. And you can see how this is a clean enough line here that in my opinion, I don't need to add quarter round. It definitely isn't perfect, so adding quarter round still might be necessary, or even if it's not quarter round, you can get a smaller piece of wood to cover this. Uh, that's not going to stick out, you know, a half inch into the room. Another common mistake people make is not subscribing to this channel so that they can hear about future mistakes that I have made so that you don't have to make them yourself. <laughs> Seriously though, I really would appreciate it if you guys do take a second and hit that subscribe button. And that brings us to mistake number five, which is failing to undercut any doorways or existing millwork or trim that is coming in contact with the subfloor. Right here you can see that we have a tiny bit of a gap between the bottom of this uh, doorway and our vinyl plank. And we have slid our vinyl plank underneath this bit of millwork just a little bit and it gives it a really nice clean look instead of having a gap there. If you don't do this, what you have to have is an expansion gap around this right here, and that's gonna look bad, and you're gonna have to use quarter round or something to cover it, and it just is not the way to go. You definitely wanna undercut all of your millwork. Let me show you how to undercut really quick. What you're gonna need is a scrap of vinyl plank, preferably the stuff you are using, or something that is the same thickness. And you're gonna set that directly down on your subfloor. So you wouldn't be setting it on top of the vinyl plank, we'd be on the original subfloor underneath this. And then you're gonna to wanna to take an oscillating tool, like this one right here, and go ahead and just plunge cut straight into the millwork or the doorway openings. And that's gonna give you a great way to create the proper gap that's needed for your vinyl plank to slide underneath. And that's what I did all around here, all around there. You can actually see we have a little bit of an issue over there, that's from, from some previous carpet that was in here. We'll have to take care of that. That's obviously too much of a gap. If you don't have an oscillating tool, the other thing you can use is a coping saw, but you're gonna do the exact same thing. It's just a regular hand saw that you're gonna saw back and forth and undercut the door and you can do it without using an oscillating tool. The nice thing about the oscillating tool is it can get back into corners and stuff if you're gonna undercut your trim, which is what we did in a lot of locations in here, uh, then you definitely wanna use an oscillating tool because uh, you're not gonna be able to use that saw in those areas the same as you can in a doorway. Mistake number six is having too much 
or not enough of an expansion gap for your vinyl plank. Obviously we covered the effects of pinning your vinyl plank earlier. Well, if you don't leave enough of an expansion gap around the outside of your uh, vinyl plank, which your manufacturer will tell you how much of an expansion gap you need, but if you don't, you can run into issues with the floor buckling, like when it gets warmer, if you installed it when it was cold, it'll get warmer and it'll actually like push or bubble up. Uh, or if you leave too much of an expansion gap, it's an unnecessary eyesore that has to be covered with a significant amount of quarter round or some other kind of trim. So just hit the exact amount that you need for expansion gaps, no more, no less. Now one tip for creating an expansion gap, if you have a spot along a wall where you just don't wanna have to use quarter round for whatever reason, like we talked about earlier, you can go ahead and undercut most materials with that oscillating tool and create an expansion gap that you can't even see that's back behind where the vinyl plank ends. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you can create expansion gaps where needed using an oscillating tool most of the time. Mistake number seven is using starting and ending boards that are too short. The way this will typically happen is you lay your board on the left hand side first typically, and then you're gonna work your way across the room. So if we had our cut off from our previous row, so you take your cut off from over there, and you bring it back here, you snap it in as your first piece, and then you work your way across the room, especially if it's a longer room, like all the way down there, and you get to the end and you just need like a two or three inch little piece right here to finish out the row. That's gonna look horrible and is definitely something you wanna avoid. So you might have to lay a few pieces of vinyl plank out across the floor in order to figure out where that end is gonna be uh, or just go based on previous rows. You can kinda usually figure out how much you're gonna have left for your last piece, but do not make it so that you have a piece that is shorter than what is recommended in the manufacturer's instructions. So all that as far as your minimum lengths and your minimum offsets should all be covered in your installation manual. Mistake number eight is working from one box of vinyl plank material at a time. Whenever you're using a product that comes in planks or even this applies to like uh, ceramic tile and other things, you want to open several cases at once and pull planks from random boxes. Because if you just use one box at a time, it's possible that you could run into issues with being able to see the differences in each batch of flooring that was produced. So we've got several cases open whenever we are working on laying out our vinyl plank. Another thing to watch for is repeating patterns. Anytime you're using vinyl plank, you're gonna have the same patterns that appear in the planks. Here's the example of the repeating pattern at my place. You can see right here, I ended up with two identical pieces right next to each other. That's the primary one that I messed up with. Uh, the other one that kind of bugs me a tiny bit is you can see those two are the same, those two are the same, but honestly, you never notice it and never really think about it unless you're looking for it. Mistake number nine is forcing the vinyl plank to do something that it doesn't want to do. Uh, you're going to have your planks like this most of the time, and then your new row is going to gonna drop in from this angle right here. And if it's not wanting to go in, it's probably because it just wasn't aligned properly. Now this really comes into play when you're talking about the interlocking of the end pieces. These are both missing their interlocking components. But right here is where those interlocking components are. And if you don't get this lined up just right, and then you go ahead and take your rubber mallet and go whack, whack, whack along there, you can create a situation where you just broke off the interlocking pieces on both pieces, or at least one of them, and then it might end up sticking up, kind of like the issue that we caused ourselves over there, even though that wasn't for that reason. So if it doesn't go with a few light taps, then you probably should just evaluate whether or not there's a piece of debris in the tongue or the groove, or if it's just not quite aligned properly. The other thing you can do is take a piece of scrap vinyl whenever you tap these in place and just set that over the top and that helps distribute the pressure down onto the vinyl plank a little bit more than just going directly on the vinyl. Uh, typically it's gonna be fine as long as you just don't go too crazy on it. And finally, the 10th mistake to avoid is just bad layouts for the way your house or your project is laid out, you gotta make sure you think about the way that you want the vinyl plank to look when you install it. One of the main things you wanna do is make sure you run your vinyl plank the long way through whatever space you're working with. On this particular property, when we first come into this entryway here, you can see the, the planks are going 
perpendicular to where we're walking in. And that's because these are tying into the overall flow of the house more so than just this particular entryway. If this entryway were going in that direction for a lot further, we probably would have ran the planks in this direction. Now you can see that since we have two adjoining rooms right here, running the vinyl plank the same way is gonna make the flow much better. And you can see we even took the time to match the width of our planks to the pattern right in the adjacent room. By keeping the planks flowing this direction, it's gonna make that space over there feel bigger and not make it feel chopped up by running all of our vinyl plank in the opposite direction. So definitely take your time whenever you are planning your vinyl plank installation. And then one more thing as far as when you get started with your first rows of vinyl plank. Make sure you take the first opportunity to run full entire rows across the room and snap a chalk line at exactly the correct measurements to get a nice straight first row. And then where needed, you actually work your way backwards. So we laid these planks from left to right, uh, coming out this direction, but where the refrigerator and uh, electric range are sitting, those spots we actually worked our way backwards and dropped the planks in from the reverse side, which is very doable. It's a little bit more tricky, but uh, it's very difficult to start with little separate sections of floor back in there and work your way out and then have it all interlock properly out here. You wanna start with a few full rows first, work backwards where necessary, and that usually works out the very best. So those are the top 10 mistakes in my opinion, but comment down below, what mistakes have you made with vinyl plank flooring and what tips and recommendations do you have? I don't install vinyl plank every day, that's part of why these mistakes are more obvious to me, uh, but definitely if you're a professional and you're willing to share what your opinions are, definitely leave those in the comment section. Always check the comments because there's always going to be people that are smarter and more experienced than I am that comment down there and I usually try to pin those comments that seem extremely useful. We're now going to take a machete and we're going to hopefully be able to reach up in there and disconnect the floor from the vinyl so that hopefully we can fix the issue that we caused. Should be free now. And I think since the silicone is still underneath there, it's still going to give me some of that cushioning effect that we kind of had the goal of. And hopefully, these seams that we're pulling apart will be able to go back down. I'm going to very carefully take this mallet and attempt to tap this back in that direction. Hopefully, we'll be able to make that lift lay back down again. Here we go. Um. Pause there. Um, it looks, it tightened up over here, but I don't think it popped down. Oh yeah, you're right, Did the gap did close. So that's good. All right, let's see if we can tap this back down and in. I'm pretty sure we did do some permanent damage. You can see a little crease right there, or a crack even. So we definitely caused ourselves some problems, but hopefully, this will make it so that, so that it will stay in there at least. Mm -hmm. It looks pretty good. Yeah, it does actually. I mean, one thing we could do is maybe pry that up and then like put some glue down in there, some super glue, and then put it back down again. But all that could have been avoided had I just, um, you know, properly done this. Looks like right here is closed up too, and we had we had a gap over here as well, and that is tightened up now as well. Costly and silly mistakes. Ole's machete saved the day. Thank you, Ole. Yeah. That's all I've got for this particular video. If you guys found it to be useful, again, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe down below, and I'll put a couple of vinyl plank related videos here on the screen for you to choose from. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week and a very successful vinyl plank installation. See ya.